pledge allegiance to the flag for the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, we have a workshop? <laughs> I don't have the paperwork. Oh, here. Well, good evening, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present to you this evening. It's uh, certainly a pleasure. Um, my name is Andre Gonzalez, and in addition to serving on the Bakersfield City Council representing Ward 2, I actually have a full-time job. Uh, and that is uh, as the executive director of a local nonprofit called Stewards. Uh, and before I get into um, what Stewards is all about, I'd like to introduce um, my chief operations manager, uh, Nicholas uh, Gonzalez. No relation to me, um, but uh, yeah, good or bad. Uh, and Nick is um, a graduate of East High School and UC Berkeley and uh, has come back home to serve his community and I'm really honored to have him working for us at Stewards and here with me tonight to share a little bit about Stewards. Um, our mission at Stewards is to ignite hope and inspire futures for those who need assistance budgeting their disability and retire retirement incomes by serving as what's called a representative payee organization. We recognize the worth and dignity of every individual by providing financial counsel, excellent stewardship, and compassionate support to help people become successful and achieve their dreams. For over 23 years, uh, since 1995, let's see if this works here. All right, Aaron, <laughs> give you the cue. For 23 years, uh, since 1995, uh, Stewards has served our local community. And then it all started um, at actually uh, the rescue mission at Kern County, uh, where a retired American Baptist pastor uh, by the name of John Marshall uh, volunteered his time to help improve the condition of the rescue mission. And he worked with many of the individuals who, uh, who lived at the facility. And he he noticed that at the first of, first of the month, many of the individuals who would help him around the facility would disappear and would disappear actually for a few weeks. And month after month, he noticed the same trend. And he began doing some investigating uh, and learned that many of the individuals who were living at the mission uh, were actually receiving social security income. They actually had money. Uh, and they would, once they received their check, would go off and uh, have some fun. And then suddenly, around the middle of the month, they would run out of money and would find themselves on the streets again and subsequently at the mission. And so to combat that, he decided to um, approach Social Security about, become, uh, about becoming a, a, a payee, managing money on behalf of many of these individuals. And from the back of his trunk, he became a payee for eight individuals at the mission. Since then, Stewards has grown to serve over a thousand clients uh, throughout Kern County. If I can, I'd like to just review some of the Social Security Administration benefit programs. There are two primary programs. Uh, as you know, the Social Security Administration is an independent federal government agency that administers two major benefit programs. For many Americans, these programs are an important source of income. And in fact, for some, they may be the only source of income. The largest of these programs is what's called the Retirement Survivors and Disability Insurance Program. Uh, this program is often referred to as Social Security. Social Security is a social insurance program that protects workers and their families from a loss of earnings because of retirement, death, and disability. Social Security benefits are based on the earnings of a worker who was paid into the system by paying Federal Insurance Contributions Act tax for a specified period of time. 
a worker or his or her family can receive RSDI benefits upon the worker's attainment of a certain retirement age, disability, or death. The other program is the Supplemental Security Income Program, or SSI. Now this is a federal income maintenance program for aged, blind, and disabled persons with little or no income or resources. Funding for SSI does not come from Social Security contributions. Rather, the United States Treasury's general funds provide financing for this program. Some state supplemental supplement the maximum SSI federal payment. Now, because SSI is a needs-based program, the amount of resources or income an individual has uh, may affect their eligibility to, uh, to payments. Uh, to receive those, those payments, a person must be age 65 or older, blind or disabled, and must have a limited income and resources. And in order to qualify, an individual cannot have over $2,000 in countable resources or $3,000 if they're a couple. Right, in poverty. So who needs a payee? Social Security usually pays benefits directly to legally competent adult beneficiaries. However, there are some exceptions. If Social, if Social Security determines a legally competent adult is unable to manage or direct the management of his or her own benefits, they will appoint a representative payee. When selecting a payee, the Social Security Administration usually first considers uh, a beneficiary's family member or close friend. But for some beneficiaries, uh, the traditional networks of support just don't exist. And for these individuals, Social Security relies on organizations such as stewards to perform the task. We have found two populations of individuals who sorely need uh, payees and need the services of stewards. Um, one is the elderly population. As you know, uh, as you may know, uh, there have been a number of, uh, and, and there's an increase in the number of elder abuse scams out in our community and nationwide over the past uh, several years. Uh, so the elderly population certainly is a vulnerable population that we seek out to serve. The second population are those individuals who are living with uh, mental health issues and, and dealing with uh, behavioral health issues that prevent them from managing their own resources on a regular basis. So what do we do exactly? We basically decide how to spend benefits to help create a stable living environment for the beneficiary and ensure that the basic current needs of food, shelter, clothing, and medical, medical care are met. Once the current needs are met, we must save any leftover funds for the beneficiary's future use. At least once per year, we are asked uh, to report on how we used those benefits on the, client, on the beneficiary's behalf. Uh, therefore, we must keep uh, very careful records uh, of both receipts uh, and deposits uh, for each beneficiary we serve. So in this way, we are able to really fulfill what the federal government has intended for the SSI program and prevent a number of waste, fraud, and abuse um, situations. As I mentioned, Stewards represents over 1,000 clients throughout Kern County and every city in the, in the county. Uh, we, have, uh, we have clients. Um, we manage uh, $11.8 million of Social Security income a year. Uh, when it comes to rent checks, we pay a lot of rent <laughs> for uh, every month. In fact, to the tune of $525,000 a month in rent. Uh, landlords love us. Um, uh, that's, that equates to uh, roughly $6.3 million in rent every year. But beyond the numbers, Stewards really seeks out to um, help the client 
live a more meaningful and uh, fulfilling life. To the extent possible, we help motivate a beneficiary to work towards more independent living. We support a beneficiary in their therapy and rehabilitation. And we encourage the beneficiary to improve the relationship with family members. And we do that with case management, uh, through building relationships with each one of our clients, by uh, a number of home visits that we make. Um, our staff uh, uh, works tirelessly to uh, keep in contact with all of our clients on a regular basis. Our goal really is to work with the most vulnerable in our community and connect them to the most appropriate housing, support services, and communities to improve their well-being. I'd like to share a story with you, if I may. This story is about a, a client who uh, was so successful, she actually left our services, which is a goal for many of our clients. Um, when, we, when we first met uh, Susan, uh, she was living on the street uh, uh, in Bakersfield, and she was struggling with, uh, a, with a drug addiction. When she began to receive SSI in 2006, um, she could not manage her money. And so we became her uh, payee. And as her client, uh, we, found her we found her a place to live uh, and began working with her on budgeting skills. Uh, we also connected her with services to help her with uh, addiction recovery. Uh, now today, uh, she is completely independent. She manages her own money. Uh, she, she no longer requires our services and she's been clean and sober for seven years. And the reason I know this is because every month on her anniversary date, she sends me a me message on Facebook uh, to share with me uh, about her success. She's very proud and we're very proud of her. But if you can see, that's really the goal since the early days of our formation when uh, Reverend John Marshall started at the back of his car um, at the rescue mission serving those clients in need to today with over a thousand clients. We really are trying to ignite hope and inspire futures for all of the most vulnerable individuals in our community. And we're very excited about the progress we've made and about the future we have uh, for our organization. And I'd like to invite you, if you know of anyone who may need our services or if you'd like us to present to your local community, to please contact me. Uh, my number is up here. Uh, my email address is andre at stewardsinc.org. And Nick and I would be more than happy to engage with you to offer our services uh, and, and have a longer conversation to do so. So with that, I thank you again for allowing me to present this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> Any uh, questions for Mr. Andre from the board or from the public? Just Seeing a comment. Me? Good job. Great. Really good job. And how, I'm sorry, could we, how does it expand to other areas like on the eastern side of the county? Uh, well, it will start with a conversation, okay. and we'll be happy to have that. And uh, and we know that the Social Security Administration is looking for uh, in for organizations to serve as a payee in various communities throughout the country. There's a there's a growing need uh, for our services, and so we'd be happy to engage in that conversation. Thank you very much, and good work, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to order please stand for the flag salute that we already did that salute pledge i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all i would like to let everybody know that mr jess ortiz has just had his 90th birthday hey. all right <laughs> Thank you, I feel real good. <laughs> <laughs>
You look the same. <laughs> Roll call. Garola. B. Smith. I am here. Wood. Here. Pasquale. Here. Mock. Cantu. Mauer. Here. Prout. Yes. Cryer. Here. P. Smith. Here. Wegman. Here. Couch. Here. Scribner. Miller. Hara. Here. Kiernan. Thank you. Item number three, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for the conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Good evening, Council. Ray Scott, Price Disposal here in Bakersfield. Um, tonight I'm representing the Kern High School District CTE Committee, the Career, Technical, and Educational um, part of the high school district, which our focus is on students and getting them ready for the workforce. Next week, for the first time, we're holding a career expo for any student in Kern County, really focused on middle school, high school students, giving them a career path for whatever they want to go into. What's astonishing is that Kern County has really turned out over 150 employers have elected to be there to give information for our students and help them with their career path, telling them these are the classes you need to take so that way you can be part of this industry. And it's, a, I've never seen 150 first time come into an expo for students. That's really what, I mean, everything that we do for CTE to educate engage and encourage our students who are our next residents, our next employees, employers, politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? My name is Jacqueline Morgan. I'm a resident of Kernville in the Kern River Valley. We are here tonight, two representatives from a group that formed that would like to be associated with you and would like to have your approval and would like to be able to work with you. And we are called, we first became aware of the problems on Highway 178 in the canyon because a good friend got very seriously hurt. We then had a community meeting and we decided we would do something about this. We asked the highway patrol officer who came to visit with us during that meeting, uh, could we please have a little bit better markings on the turnouts so that we knew how to get out of somebody's way who was tailgating us? And the CHP officer said, there are no turnouts. That's why you can't find them. As a result, our group, fellow travelers on Highway 178 called upon our Senator Fuller, got her support, through her got support from the Caltrans people, and we now have seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven turnouts on the canyon section of Highway 178. Now we've been told by the Caltrans people that we've worked with and with the uh, highway patrol people that we've worked with that there are three things to highway safety. Engineering, enforcement, education. We have endeavored to do the education part and we have certainly endeavored to work with the engineering part. And the reason we are here, and we have one of the other members of our board, 
who happens to be my husband, uh, to talk to you about joining with you, since we are not a city, but joining with you to make highways safer in our communities, we have now also gone to Highway 155, and we are working further on 178 to get turnouts and to get the engineering improved. Now I'd like to turn it over to Don Morrison. I'm Don Morrison, and I live at 13 Oak Place in Kernville. I am the chairman of the uh, steering committee for the 178 Fellow Travelers Group, which is about 100 people that have band together in the Kern River Valley. Uh, and almost all of them are people who've lost a loved one, had a serious accident, or had some very scary experience uh, in the Kern River Canyon. In fact, there are very few people that live up there with us that haven't had a scary experience in the canyon at some time in their life, if they've been there any length of time at all. The th reason that we're here is when we found out uh, quite recently that the call boxes had been removed, we were concerned because we're concerned that motorists that have trouble in the canyon now have a, a, an additional problem of trying to get some help. Uh, we've been in touch with as my wife said, the CHP and Caltrans and uh, the Forest Service, a whole host of agencies, and we've known for some time that their radios don't work together. Uh, for example, a CHP officer in need of help cannot talk to a sheriff's uh, deputy that maybe is a half a mile away uh, and let him know that he needs some help because they're on two different kinds of radios. And we've been aware of this for about a year or more. What has to happen is the one officer has to talk to his dispatcher. His dispatcher has to call up the dispatcher of the other organization, and then he can talk to his officer. But the two can't talk to each other. Uh, and it's, a, it's been a serious problem. We um, can't even call by cell phone and our CH people mostly use cell phones because there's no cell tower coverage down in the canyon. Uh, it's also a problem of even stating where the problem is because the, the walls of the canyon are so vertical that GPS doesn't work. Uh, if, you've, if you've got Cirrus XM, you know that the signal comes and goes, comes and goes where you are because the rocks are in the way. We saw, because Marcia Smith, the editor of our newspaper, <coughs> gave us the minutes of your last meeting, that you all were interested in, in working with CHP uh, uh, on this whole business about communications in the canyon, and uh, that apparently you asked county council to work on that issue with you. Um, and we also saw in your minutes that uh, Senate Bill 615 was mentioned, which we knew nothing about until then, and we got a copy of it, read it, and ultimately that led to us contacting Senator Fuller again because she's been so helpful to us in the past, and Tyler, one of her assistants, is working with us to do some research to find out what can be done to try to develop some kind of communication system in the canyon for motorists and for uh, public agencies as well. The other thing that's just happened in the last couple of days is that AT&T put in a new tower in the valley uh, to support the state agencies. And lo and behold, when they did that, and we're not, we, we just found this out a couple of days ago, we don't know how that all happened, but the local people all of a sudden found that their AT&T phones worked much better than they did before. Supposedly, this tower was just for the state agencies and somehow, it, it's working to help everyone, and we were pleased with that. Uh, we met with the Ham Radio Club about a month ago and presented some of these problems, and they said to us that if you can get a cell tower on the north side of the river, then everybody could have cell communications. The 
public agencies and private individuals who need help. And uh, AT&T, we contacted this morning and they said, uh, yes, uh, we can put up a cell tower. It only costs three to six million dollars. And uh, then you would have communications down in, through the canyon. Um, but you gotta first show us that you have some land where we can put it. You either have to have donated land or some land we can buy or whatever, and then we'll talk to you some more. But until you come up with some land, <laughs> We can't really tell you anymore. Uh, obviously, this is just a very early evolving s uh, kind of pro uh, program that we're pursuing. We don't know what the best way is to get some communications for motorists and for uh, public agencies as well. So we're exploring it. We're looking at various alternatives. Uh, and what we would really want to do is just let you know what we're up to and try to coordinate whatever we're doing with whatever you're doing and uh, seek advice if you can help us with uh, this, just as we hope to get some more help from the research that Senator Fuller's uh, representative is going to uh, bring to us. We will keep you informed with progress reports as we go along and uh, try to answer your questions as best we can. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Aaron, did somebody touch base with them? Sure. Uh, do you have uh, contact information? We'll get that for you. And we'll try to uh, attend. And you have uh, regular meetings? Uh, more than regular meetings. All right, thank you very much. Item number four, consent agenda. The consent agenda, all items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kerncog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before an action is taken. We have items A through Q. I'll make a motion on consent if there's no public comments. And I will second for the same. Roll call vote. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Maurer? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Couch? Yes. Miller? Yes. Para? Yes. Thank you. Item number five, 2017 Federal Transportation Improvement Program, Draft Amendment number 12, Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. The amendment includes revisions to the non-motorized program to incorporate new active transportation program projects for the city of Bakersfield, McFarland, Tehachapi, and Wasco. The public review period began February 2nd and ends February 16th. The Kern-Cog Executive Director will consider approval of the amendment February 20th State and federal approval is required. And at this time, I ask that the chair please open the public hearing, allow for public comment, and then close the public hearing. Okay, I'll open the public hearing. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, I'll close public hearing. Thank you. Is that it? Any board comments? Okay, Caltrans report. Okay, I made it. <laughs> so my first uh, project to report on is going to be Famosa, uh, the 4699 bridge replacement. Um, PG&E and AT&T completed the relocation west of Route 99 on December 22nd. 
North Kern Water District shut down the water in, in Laredo Canal on January 1st and allowed a window to uh, of up to January 20th to complete installation of the culvert in the canal. This activity was completed January 19th and um, work for the next four weeks was to construct the temporary southbound off-ramp construction frontage road south of 46 and construct a temporary southbound on-ramp and complete drainage work at these locations. The new southbound off-ramp off -ramp and on-ramp um, will be opened February 23rd. Uh, at this point, uh, they're anticipating that at this time next year, this project will be complete. So the next one is um, Taft Highway uh, Rehabilitation. It's uh, near the city of Bakersfield from north of the Herring Road over crossing to Pacheco Road under crossing. The tentative start date is going to be in March, so I'll be reporting on that coming up soon. Uh, and then we've got State Route 46, um, which is um, the widening of 46 from two lanes to four lanes um, between Lost Hills Road and I-5. Uh, the contract was approved February 2nd, and construction is anticipated in April. I'll look forward to also reporting on that one. Uh, Cottonwood East Rehab, um, that's a rehabilitation on State Route 58 in Bakersfield from Cottonwood Road under crossing to just east of uh, State Route 58 and 184 separation. The project start date is going to be March 29th. And then we've got the Kern State Route 65 rumble strips. Um, and that is going to be um, in Kern County from 7th Standard Road to north of Avenue 196. That was awarded January 29th, and we're still waiting for contract approval. And last uh, is on 30, State Route 33 and 119. Those are also to install centerline rumble strips, um, and that's on various locations on 33 and 119. And we've got a tentative start date of April. And then that concludes my uh, project update. But I wanted to share some information with, um, and I'm really targeting this information towards the smaller agencies. Um, because of getting federal aid money can be very painful. It's a lot of hoops. Uh, SB1 money is going to be even harder. There's a, a, just a lot of accountability and transparency. So what I'm, what I'm wanting to, which we've always offered, is my local, and usually that money is through local assistance. We do have grant money coming from planning, but um, which is not quite as difficult, but getting money from um, local assistance and doing off-system off projects, a lot of I's to dot, a lot of T's to cross. Um, my staff is more than willing to come to your agencies and a lot of the smaller agencies don't have a full staff just because it's it's just a, they just don't have the budget and so it's difficult sometimes they have to hire consultants to do their engineering or even as you know city managers public works but my staff is willing to walk you through that because the downside of not doing it correctly is losing your money you will not get reimbursed and so um, I've had, we've had a couple issues, um, not just in, in this district or this area, but throughout other agencies. And so um, it's not, I mean, it's not uncommon, but we're here to help. We can solve a lot of problems. So it doesn't have to happen. So I just wanted to offer that up. So um, just to, to let you know. So anyway, and that was, all I had, unless there's questions. Is there anything I need to look into when I get back? Miguel, we have a question over here. Thank you. Uh, for the areas on the east, we're out of the bishop office. So same, should we go through you, Gail? Or how do we coordinate? Yeah, we, we changed those boundary lines. So, oh, someone, can you um, I've reached out to Jay Schwalm, who's in touch. He actually Perfect. Like Perfect. That's all I need. Thank you. Any other comments? Thank you. Executive Director's Report. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair. Um, before I start with my 
uh, comments. Thank you, Gail. Uh, another, uh, another forum where you can work out issues with projects is all of your staff members just about uh, attend a TTAC meeting every month, and that is staffed with um, a Caltrans representative. That's, that's a great forum where the cities can work together, help each other. Current COG staff is available. Um, th thank you for your comments, Gail. But in, in addition to that, the TTAC is a, a great place to uh, ask for help if you need help or bounce ideas off of other cities uh, or to talk to the other cities about challenges or successes. Uh, I just have a few items tonight, Madam Chair. Uh, as I mentioned last month, but it happened a day after our meeting, very important job in San Bernardino County had their uh, ground breaking on January 19th. That's the Kramer Junction project, uh, a project on 58 to widen the last section of 58 to four lanes, uh, and that kicked off on January 19th. That's a project that was probably 50 years in the making. So congratulations to, uh, to uh, San Bernardino County. On January 25th, I attended a STIP hearing in Irvine uh, where I pitched uh, Kern Cog's proposal for uh, about, uh, set about $90 million of projected income that we will have starting July 1st. On January 31st and February 1st, I attended a CTC meeting in Sacramento. On February 23rd, um, coming up next week, I have a meeting with District 9 staff, uh, District Director, Planning Director, and uh, Maintenance Director to talk about the efforts um, in Eastern Kern. Specifically, District 9 serves the cities of Tehachapi, California City, Ridgecrest, and the unincorporated area of Kern County, everything east of roughly Keene. On March 21st and 22nd, I'll be attending another CTC meeting in the city of Orange. And on March 22nd and 23rd, the California Air Resources Board will be meeting uh, to go over SB for uh, the targets for our greenhouse gas emissions. Subject to any of your questions, Madam Chair or board members, that concludes my report on this agenda. Any questions or comments for the executive director? I guess not. Thank you, Warren. Let's go into the current Council of Governments agenda. You might want to reflect that uh, Mr. Garolo is here. Okay. Um, public comments. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the Council on any matter, not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the Council. Council members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the council at a later meeting. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, the consent agenda. The consent agenda, all items are considered to be routine and non-controversial by Kern Cox staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. We have items A through D. Motion on consent. Second. Roll call vote. Garola? Aye. B. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Maurer? Yes. Prout? Yes. Cryer? Yes. P. Smith? Yes. Wegman? Yes. Couch? Yes. Executive Director's Report. Good evening again, Madam Chair and Board Members. As a reminder, March 1st are the Kern Cog Regional Awards. It'll be held at Seven Oaks Country Club. Please make your reservations. We already have over 190 reserved seats. We typically only can take 200, but um, they've allowed us to go up to 220. But we're, we, are, we have much higher attendance uh, than in any previous years that I can remember. So if you want to come, please get your tickets within the next week. And um, I'll, go, uh, I'll go over uh, what's in your folders in, in a second. March 6th and 7th, uh, I'll be attending along with the other seven um, 
Central Valley COG directors and their staffs and several elected officials um, will be meeting with elected officials and staff in Sacramento. If any of you are interested in attending, please let me know in the next uh, couple of weeks. In your folders tonight is an article uh, on Councilman Phil Smith. Congratulations, Council Member. <laughs> Careful now. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. And I, and I think Tehachapi has bought at least forty tickets. All right. A along with McFarland buying mm, at least fifty tickets. Wow. Wow. Uh, so th there's also a schedule of cash disbursements, timeline that covers the next five months, a save the date uh, memorandum for a very well attended uh, kickoff meeting for the updating of the um, SIP guidelines, which will probably take about a year. A very interesting article uh, that clearly spells out the economic impact of congestion. Uh, outreach efforts and a clean transportation summit and that's all I have for um, for you tonight, Madam Chair and Board Members, subject to any of your questions. All right, Ms. Mayor Wood. Just a quick question. Um, the electric vehicle charging stations, um, I haven't seen anything for a while on them. Are there opportunities in the future coming up for our cities to apply for, possibly? Uh, a absolutely. We have an expert on our staff. Lin Santa Bob. <laughs> oh, Santa I, I was thinking about Linda, but maybe Bob's an <laughs> expert, too. Actually, uh, we have two programs that are, I'm preparing a program, a project for this next board meeting, is we have a program uh, provided by Caltrans that combine, uh, combines STAF funds, that's State Transit Assistance Funds, and State of Good Repair program that just started off three weeks ago. They're taking SB1 money and uh, distributing it to transit operators through the STAF program and the uh, State of Good Repairs program, we receive as a region $7 million. So uh, I, I think Cal uh, California City has about $200,000. I've been trying to get in touch with your staff over there to um, you know, get them through the process, but uh, the State of Good Repair has maintenance programs, vehicle replacement. Uh, we also have, um, you could use that as a, a new facility uh, is to put in charging stations. Also, the second POP program that's coming up this month is a low carbon and transit operating program. And there's a $1.1 million uh, countywide for that program. I think uh, Cal City gets about 38000 So I'm trying to fill that POP by Tuesday. We're off Monday. But I've been calling everybody in Kern County uh, sometimes, several times. So um, anyways, I'm, I'm getting it together, and we should have that information by Tuesday of next week. Uh, you're not having ex any success with us right now, or? Craig hasn't returned my uh, call. Uncle I think he's out off on vacation. He's actually got a back injury. Okay, and Jason hasn't returned my phone calls. I'll talk to him. Okay. Thank you, sir. First thing. Bye. In, ad in addition to what Bob said, Mayor, Mayor Wood, is uh, Shafter has been on the leading edge of converting to electric vehicles, and, and almost all this, uh, well, ev everybody here today um, operates a transit system. The only ones that don't are Bakersfield and Maricopa, but uh, converting many, and many of you use vans for your um, dial-a-ride, that is an eligible capital expense to convert uh, a non-electric non vehicle to an electric vehicle, and the, the charging that goes along with that is certainly an eligible capital expense. And many of you have um, vehicles, including GET, that are support vehicles like like reg regular cars uh, that as long as they're used for for transit purposes you could u use those funds to say uh, get has probably over a dozen support vehicles would be my guess converting those vehicles to electric and then putting in charging stations to charge them would be an eligible expense and, and I'd be glad to talk to any of you or your staff about ideas like that. I appreciate that. I know that we met with Bob Neath last week and we were talking about 
what's going to happen with the new electric buses that are dedicated to the side t between California City and, and Lancaster, and I'm hopefully that might help in that capacity in addition to additional stops. We're, gonna, we're seeing that we need additional stops uh, with proper crosswalks to prevent the Che walking accidents. So thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Seeing none, this meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.